All right, everyone, it is interview time, and we are here with a very special episode called April Squared. Just kidding, that's not what it's called. <laughs> Maybe it should be. Oh, it's an Amy Sandwich. Oh, Triple A, A, A team. A team, A team. So I'm Amy, as you know, but uh, we have uh, my girlfriend, April Lamper, over here, but we have April Hirschman here, author of the new book, Desire Makes Me Brave. And we are super excited to talk to April. And it's not just about this book, we're talking about how to lose your erotic virginity, something about like a slut oath or something about something along those lines. You yeah. let it take its own quilting. Like it's a Thank quilt you. making its way to be this beautiful blanket that you can wrap yourself in. Just like this pillow April has that a young person's made for her that is a nip or a breast. I, I asked her <laughs> she for commissioned it. like a 15 year old. No, she's 12 <laughs> and she loves crocheting genitals. Uh, her mm-hmm. mom told me she's like, um, so thank and it matches you. our book cover. And it ma- why well, I, I asked her, I was like, and she's gonna make a Volva next. And it matches uh, April Hirschman's book cover because we have the same colors on our yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. not about all these things. Uh, so here we go. Okay, so anyways, y'all heard a little bit about April Hirschman uh, in the bio. And as you know, if you listen to Shameless Sex all the time, we always want to learn more about our guests. So April, uh, we're so happy to have you on our show. And can you please tell us and our listeners a little bit more about how you got into the field of sexuality? Yeah. Well, it started with having permissive slash neglectful parents. So there wasn't, but to their credit, they weren't very shaming. And so we could have like boyfriends over to stay the night at our house when we were like 16, me and my sisters, whatever, whenever we got that age. (laughs) So That was nice. And I think also being a belly dancer was a big part of it. When I was doing belly dancing, it was a lot at like women only queer goddess worshiping events. So we would like dance topless and feel really safe. And it was all about like sisterhood and expressing our sexuality in a really safe way and a really fun way. So I think belly dancing really got me into my body and feeling comfortable being seen essentially. And then uh, next up, my sister Celeste Hirschman and her business partner, Danielle Harrell, started the Somatica Embodiment Sex Training Institute. And so in 2020, I did that training and uh, now I'm a sex and relationship coach. Oh, nice. And I did in 2016. Woo! Yeah. Is that what? So wait, so April, you did it in what year? 2020. 2020. Yeah. Interesting year to do it too. Were there like paper bags or like masks over everyone's faces? Like, hey, can't touch me here. Or like you had to like saran wrap yourself or was it (laughs) online? Yeah. So it was so weird because, right, I could have done it for like over a decade. The moment I chose to do it was online and I was really upset at first. And then it turned out to be the best because I was living alone. I was mostly single and I had connection through Zoom training and I had a whole new career birth during the pandemic. So it was actually perfect. Oh, and good. that career was needed not only just now, but during the pandemic, like the online work. Too, so. Exactly. To do with our relationship. Besides watching Netflix every fucking day. Uh, <laughs> And we met you in person when we did our our first kind of book party, like our official. I was stoked to meet you because I've known your sister digitally as well. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't met her in person. And then she was like, this is my sister, uh, April. I was like, what? You have a sister named April? <laughs> I already love her. And you were fantastic. And to have you on the show, that was in November, I believe, that we met. And now this is already, my God, it's May 2024. But it's fabulous to see you. And I know you also are a California human. You live in California. And this work that you're doing, your new book, and as well as the work that you have done before and through this like beautiful lens of having, I believe your sister is probably some sort of motility device. That sounds weird, <laughs> like a sperm, but you know, like a motility device to like maybe um, activate this sort of desire seeking bravery. But I don't know if it has anything to do with her. It's probably just about you too. But let's get on with my question, April, my April. Not you, April. Your new book. So it's titled Desire Makes Me Brave, which I love. So desire is a huge part of our book, Shameless Sex. And so I love this title. So how does desire make you or anyone or everyone brave? Yeah. So brave desire is definitely connected with confidence. And it's also connected with being queer. So being bisexual 
you can't be quiet about it. You kind of have to be brave. You have to be like, I want to date women. I want to figure out how to approach a woman. So if you're heterosexual, it's it's much easier to just sort of fit in without having to claim anything, right? Because usually people don't claim their heterosexuality or if they do, it can be annoying. But <laughs> if you're queer, you have to you have to claim it. So just that alone is very brave. And then I grew up in a hippie commune. I'm an extrovert. So I, most of the time, am pretty brave about approaching. And um, approaching women to date is very terrifying. So I I just try to be brave and give myself a little pep talk. <laughs> so those are some of the manifestations of it. Yeah. Is that the same for everyone? Like even people that perhaps our penis owners, like, because it's about like, like anyone, like, can anyone relate to being brave by just like jumping out of their own shell, especially if it comes to bisexual or their own sexuality? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And it's definitely not just about being queer, being bisexual. It's really about not choosing, you know, what's easy or what's normative and just checking in with yourself. Like, what do I want and what will it take for me to get that? And my book shows a very alternative way of being in the world just because that's who I am. I don't have kids. I've never been married. And I focus a lot on like travel, art. And so my I hope my life in itself is an example of how to have brave desire without a roadmap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, where's the roadmap at, everyone? I mean, we, I guess we all, we both created books that's trying to give people a, a roadmap, roadmap in different ways. And so I think that it's like, you know, once we're adults, we are like, okay, if we, if we choose to, to go on that journey, like, where's the roadmap to figure out my desire, you know, my sexuality, my, like, how am I aroused? Who am I into? All these things. How do I exist in this world as an erotic person? So, so, and then continuing on with the roadmap, this is something that you and I talked about earlier. And, and I know that, you know, you and I, uh, April, we talked about April, uh, other April, not April, never <laughs> talked about how um, the term virginity, you know, we're not in love with. And yet it's kind of hard to find another term for this that people relate to. So we're going to go with this word knowing that virginity is a little loaded, everyone. But what does it mean to lose your erotic virginity? And what does this process entail? Yeah, that's what one of the themes are. And it's definitely one of the big themes in this book. So yeah, we certainly aren't born. No, we aren't born knowing everything. And it's like none of us got sex education. So losing your erotic virginity for me was like at each stage, me trying something that felt unfamiliar, but I wanted to experience to increase my pleasure. So I used to be really quiet around sex. And then I started making sounds, which felt inauthentic at first and then became involuntary, which was great. I can still remember, I talk about a lover in Nepal in my book, the first time I like touched my clit while he was penetrating me, which felt at the time like very bold. I know this is <laughs> maybe not as bold now, but you know, that felt really intense and edgy. And now that's just my lovers have to know that's how I have to do it. And so it's just different eras of our life where we explore different things about our own pleasure. And so, so you're taking like an inventory, like you're looking back at all these parts of like when I was, you know, 16, 18, 25 and like where, you know, where was I not being vocal? Where was I making a sound that was vocal that was not me? Or where was I, you know, not advocating for myself or touching myself or, you know, so is it like that kind of thing is like a journaling exercise or? Right. Well, it journaling is always a good idea. I love that actually. Maybe we're creating something right now, like an inventory of what you've experienced, what you don't want to experience, and what you do want to experience. That'd be a fun, like three column thing. And uh, yeah, for me, it just sort of happened organically. I didn't write about it as much, but I definitely talk about it in the book, like which which levels. And there's always more, right? We're always short- shedding more erotic virginity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think maybe virginity because virginity has such this biblical essence to it, right? So sometimes it can be it's not triggering for me. I don't give a fuck like about a lot of things unless people are like um, saying something that's really vile and and hateful. But like virginity does have this biblical sense. And a lot of sex educators are like, oh, we shouldn't say lose your virginity, which I agree with. It is having sex for the first time. Um, so maybe it's like this first time, this essence of something that is created in your sexuality for the first time where, you're, where you've had this experience. And I remember the first time that I was able to and it was not that long ago, to be honest with you, where I was able to orgasm from oral alone, 
without anything yeah. else, a oral, an oral tongue, an oral mouth on my, and I was like, I just lost my, I just popped my oral cherry because that <laughs> yeah. has not happened to me before. And so it's sort of this, this, like, what is your essence of, of the first time you experience this thing with your sexuality like an opening, that right? opens, yeah, that yeah, opens opening. Pandora's box to what is more. Mm -hmm. So, and then we keep talking about maps, but what I'm thinking about because you talked about the map and we talk about maps in our book. And I'm like, damn it, I sh we should have said something else in the book because there's some people that are probably listening right now that could be in like their 20s that aren't millennials that are like, map. the fuck is a map? Like, that's like something you plug into Google and it tells you where to go. So it's like, think of it as a GPS. It's yeah. Siri. Yo, Siri, how the fuck do you get your sexuality to be open? So these, it's about reading or having someone read to you. So I was thinking about that. I mean, I don't want to say right, but I'm like, what do you all think about that? Is it I a like GPS? That. And then in 20 years, it won't be called GPS. It'll be something else. It'll be called Super Mr. Roboto. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your erotic, yeah, your erotic map to your GPS to your Mr. Your erotic yeah. Roboto. Yeah, your erotic, yeah, erotic. erotic blueprint. Yeah. To getting you to please. space, to Saturn and sitting on the sun. Ooh, Damn, ooh. that might burn those That's a lot of S's. All right. <laughs> That's going to chafe. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, we're gonna we'll change back to this, everyone. Okay, so I have a question there. Those were just like a little bit of of my uh, insightful uh, processes that I was going through as I was listening. Because I'm really appreciating though this journey, April, and thank you for sharing. And I'm excited to learn more about your book. But first, okay, what happens? That's not a commercial time, everyone. Okay, so don't don't start fast fucking forwarding like you usually do. <laughs> so. What happens next in terms of this, your erotic virginity, your erotic openness, your erotic essence of like what's happening with your sexuality when you experience this one thing for the first time or these many things for the first time after someone has reviewed the different eras of their own erotic self? So I know that you've talked about it in a few different ways, but what if they haven't been able to advocate for themselves or been able to discover themselves? What the fuck do they do next? Yeah. And when we're in higher arousal, it's harder to advocate for ourselves if we've been, you know, socialized to be pleasers, which most um, people socialize as women have. And to be honest, it still happens. Like I recently had sex where I didn't advocate for myself a lot. So <laughs> to just de-shamify de it, right? Yeah. Boundaries are an imperfect science. So yeah, but we really want our partner or our partners to be advocating for ourselves too. Like that could just be a conversation before you have sex. Like I want to advocate for myself, but I want you to advocate for me too. And I was also telling a partner, like it's a whole thing to have like a vulva and a vagina and, you know, we can get UTIs and yeast infections easier. And it's like, I want, if, if that happens, it happened to us. And I want you to go to the drugstore with me or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like, so how can we feel more collaborative and like we're taking care of each other's physical boundaries, health boundaries, or health safety together? Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah. You can test like the pH of your entire body by your vagina sometimes. <laughs> Those vaginas are powerful. It, they are. Yeah. They're powerful. Yeah. yeah. Anything goes in there and they're just like killing germs off of it immediately. It's yeah. so yeah. powerful. Yeah. It's like a barometer. You're like, wait. <laughs> yeah. Is there going to be an earthquake inside my body? Oh, no. I finally get sick. So oh my, my vagina is unhappy. That's like the next science that the, 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 the vaginas are the ones that we are able to tell us when the earthquakes are I'm coming. I'm like, I can tell when it's going to rain. I'm yeah. just like, mm, that makes sense. No, but, here it's like it's like uh, testing the, the direction of the wind with your finger. And just like put her sand. finger as if it was going in her pussy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm curious with, with what you said um, in this, this ties with that. Um, with the um, you know speaking up for yourself and people pleasing, how has being a bisexual woman made it hard for you to get out of the habit of people pleasing and focus and, and and actually focusing on what you want? Like, and how does this relate to bisexuality? Yeah, it's really hard to not be a people pleaser as a bisexual because we don't fit into a box, we don't fit into a completely straight bar, or we don't fit into a queer bar. There's no bisexual bars, you know, so. I have found myself and it happens even now wanting to edit myself for my audience. Like, uh, you know, if I'm talking to straight people or people I perceive to be conventional and then it feels hard to say, and then my ex-girlfriend, you know, and then when I'm a really queer space or it's during pride, I can feel this desire to not say, oh, my boyfriend or my ex-boyfriend. So it's really hard to navigate that. And in the book, I talk about uh, me and my sister used to host the bisexual film night at Frameline Film Festival. And this sort of 
kind of older stooped, not super attractive gay man, you know, was asking me what I was doing with the festival. And I was like, oh, I'm doing a bisexual night. And he's like, oh, well, I'm not bisexual. I have a husband. And he physically backed away from me. Like bisexuality was some disease he could catch just by talking to me and that there was any world in which I was hitting on him. And so it's just an example of how, right, this is a queer event. This is a queer man who's shaming me about my bisexuality. And then, you know, people are used to seeing you with a woman and then they see you with a man and they're like, what's this about? And that just is like, constant. So I really try to be like, April, don't play to your audience. Like just tell the truth, tell the truth about your history and what's happening in the moment. That's so dope. Okay. So I don't have any issues with like the long, like LGBTQIA plus um, and acronym, <laughs> but like I have advocated because when I was doing my, just getting my certification and I feel like I had a certification, but I started really diving deep into the the sexuality, like getting my sex ed certification. And there are a lot of folks that advocate for this term, like gender and relationship diversity, rather than LGBTQIA+, mm. because it simplifies everything where you don't have to feel like I'm bisexual. I'm labeling myself as asexual. I'm labeling myself as gay. I'm labeling myself as lesbian. I'm li because it's so fluid. How can we? And then when you meet some folks, and and if you just say like, "We're I'm on this flag of this gender and relationship diversity flag," instead of this long twelve letter going process, it also makes like the normies out there more comfortable thinking mm -hmm. like, oh, I represent and I advocate for gender and relationship diversity, not just the flag of LGBTQIA+, which I respect all the folks that are under all those flags. But it just kind of solidifies like what I thought in the back of my brain when I first learned that. And it's a bummer that it's like, oh, you're bisexual. So you're automatically being labeled as this thing mm -hmm. that you're you're taking on all of these other people's labels about what bisexuality means. And maybe that is something that is like um, liberating for folks to be like, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I identify as a pansexual and that's like liberating for them or, or demisexual and that's liberating for them. That's great. But like, it's, there's like so many ways that folks could get the message across without having to feel like they have to identify as something specific it, in that, like in that whole, like non-binary world of sexuality where it's just like it's vast it seems a lot like the neuro we're using neurodiversity now instead of like you know like oh you know you must be add when like i don't even know or if you are or not or, yeah, yeah or they, they're like yeah it's yeah. it's neurodivergent but then some people within that might be like you know i'm neurodivergent but i am you know adhd and and i and i own that as who i am and so this I is think, such a juicy yeah. topic because i love that term you know gender and sexual diversity because it puts us all together Together, where it still feels like with the flag and the alphabet soup, we're still being marginalized mm -hmm. and straight people or heteronormative people are being centralized. So I think that is a really great way to look at it. I mean, language is really evolving right now. And I loved in high school when I would just be tipsy and I would lean over and kiss my women friends and we didn't interrogate each other. Well, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Are you a lesbian? Well, what does this mean? Are you bisexual? It just felt like an expression of free love. It felt this, like an expression of feminism. Like, of course, I'm going to turn over and kiss this woman. And it just felt it was so beautiful to be in that time where it wasn't named. Mm -hmm. And the thing about claiming bisexual is, you know, bisexual you, was very recently, you know, pathologized. And so when we claim it and name it, we have a history, we have a flag, we have all those people that fought for it and they deserve to be named. And so I really want to live in a both and world. I want to move more towards what you're saying about the, the gender and sexual diversity and putting us all in the same pool and it's ever shifting like water. And also how do we hold the stories of, you know, our, our trans folks and our queer folks and lesbians and gays and et cetera, that did that work. And without a name, they couldn't have done it. Like that's the thing about, they used to call gay or lesbian, the love that had no name. And I talk about bisexual as the love that has no place. <laughs> Again, we don't have a bar. <laughs> so yeah, this is, is such a delicious topic. Mm -hmm. This is, and I, I, I do appreciate you saying like giving our like honor 
and to the people that did fight for the labels, for the naming of, yeah. of what the, these sexualities are. And I'm not disassociating myself from that. And I don't want folks out there too. I just think it might at this point be easier on everybody else that's outside of that for now to consider something that's more simplistic because our fucking brains cannot take any more uh, complications. And it's triggering for like straight white cis fucking dudes out there that they want to be woke on some level, but they can't be because they feel like it's too complicated. And I'm not speaking for the straight fucking white dudes. I'm <laughs> speaking for pretty much like any of my, my Midwestern friends that are like, I just feel so uncomfortable when it comes to this. And I'm like, that's okay to feel uncomfortable. So simplifying it would be great. But Amy has a question about your book. So oh, we're yes. going to get onto that. This goes hand in hand with what we were just talking about, though, because so in your book, you talk about having periods where you only date men and then you only then you only date women. So my, this is my multifaceted question. So have you always been and this is I'm going to say this in a way where like you know, most people think that bisexual like across the board, I'm equally into men and women or all genders all all genders to be more pansexual, but have you always been air quotes equally into all genders? And was there anything in your life that moved you to choose to date one gender over the other at different times? Like right now, I'm just going to date men. And then uh, the men thing didn't work out. So I'm just to date women. Like, like, what was that like for you? Yeah, well, we're, we're socialized to as a woman to be attracted to men. So I was it's hard to unpack, right? How much of it was like, yeah, I'm definitely attracted to men and masculinity. And I'm attracted to masculinity and women too. And it's hard to unpack, well, is that socialization or is that inherent, you know, especially when you're young. So when I was younger, I was definitely dating men more. And then it was a bit of a leap to have my first girlfriend because there was still felt very taboo. And so different eras, you know, when I had my girlfriend, Becca, and we were together about seven years, I was just, you know, I was in San Francisco and I have this great pride crew and it was just fun to just really immerse myself in the queer community. But it doesn't mean I wasn't still attracted to men. I think what I've stopped doing is to say like, oh, I'm only going to be with women now, or I'm only going to be with men because I am on this earth long enough to realize that that's not true. And it feels really really nice to just know, you know, it can shift at any time. Word for that, April. Word <laughs> for that. So your book also shares stories about threesomes and our listeners, a lot of people outside of even our listenership love learning about threesomes. Our book has a whole section on that. So first off, are we talking about um, like FFM? Are we talking about MF, MMF? Or are we talking about FFF? Or are we talking about bi folks? Uh, are we talking about the perfect unicorn? Are we talking about all of this shit? Uh, like, and people that are like, what is this FF? Um, 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 is it ABC? Is it WWF? No. <laughs> and UFC? No. And I think just are, are all bi folks like the perfect unicorn? And are, are all bi folks into threesomes? Right. So of course I can't speak for all bi folks, but I will speak for myself. I, uh, I do like threesomes, but it's hard to succeed at them. It's been hard for me. And it so much depends on like, is this a couple? Am I part of the couple? Are we all strangers in the night? And I have mostly done female, female, male, and I would love to do male, male, female. <laughs> I would love to do female, female, female. Whenever I tell my queer women friends like that I've had failed three thumbs, are they like, what was it with two other women? I'm like, no. And they're like, that's why I failed. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> okay, great. Probably true. So yeah, I talk about some of my threesomes. I've had a lot of failed threesomes and I feel like they failed often because they didn't bring me closer to people. They brought me further away. And you and I or all of us were talking about tips, you know, for a threesome. And I think one of the tips is asking people in advance, what do you want after this, this threesome? And I'm not just talking about cuddles and, you know, words of affirmation afterwards, like, do you want to text the next day? Do you want to text the next week? Do you want flowers? Do you want us to ever to see each other again? Are we going to be friends? Or are we going to continue to be lovers? Because what I call, you know, my failed, which is maybe too strong of a word, but the threesomes that I didn't like is I got less connected from those people. In fact, there's two incidents where I never saw those people again. And that's not what I wanted. Oh my God, that's such a good point. So please continue because I have such a deep, juicy question after that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I was just thinking of other tips that people don't always think of. And before you have the threesome, I think it's good to talk about what are your healing senses. So a healing sentence is if you get triggered, if you get upset, what do you need to hear? That's just going to bring you right back into your body and make you feel loved or cared for. So healing sentences could be, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here for you. Right. Especially if I have abandonment healing sentences could be like, you know, Hey, you told me that sometimes you check out, are you checking out right now, honey? That could be your healing sentence. Or it could be, I need you to tell me, I just want to be with you. I don't need anything from you. So maybe that's the healing sense. So if you know in advance, it can create so much of a bridge between someone's trigger and upset. And then you say that sentence and you can often get back into pleasure, get back into threesome, as opposed to someone feeling like I'm so upset, I'm triggered, I have to leave, (laughs) you know, and Mm -hmm. we don't want that to happen. Okay. I'm totally down with this advice. And I agree with you on that. And my question is, because this has come up not only for me, but some of my friends in terms of the threesomes to have and with whom, right? Because friends, is it a no or is it a yes or is it a maybe so? Because there are certain friends like Amy, I know her and I could never be in a sexual relationship with another dude. We could probably fuck maybe in the same room with our dudes or other people. But I know that I could not like eat her pussy. Like I know that. Oh, yeah, please. And the the, the same, like we are like siblings. There are certain friends that I'm like, hmm, that I've had over that at my house before that because of my career. And this is why I'm asking you, I really want your fucking true opinion uh, where they're like hot, gorgeous female friends. I identify as a probably a pansexual person, maybe bisexual, but it just, it actually depends right now. I'm, I'm mostly focusing on the penis owning partner that I have. So, cause we, so have- April, you're saying I have a chance. <laughs> yeah. yeah. April, okay, yeah, dude. April, <laughs> April, 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 on April, action, yeah. April, on April. <laughs> So Sorry, I've got this sorry. amazing, this love amazing it. I have a fucking love it too. And next time, <laughs> and yes, I'm totally <laughs> open to that. But I, so I dated my best friend that was a woman when I was 19 and we dated for like dating, meaning we fucked and we were like together for like a year and a half, maybe two years. And it ruined our fucking friendship. Mm-hmm. She came out after that. And I um, swore to my myself then that I would never, ever fuck a friend that I considered someone that was a friend, especially a vulva owner. So I've had friends now in my career, like fast forward that have been like, yo, I'm down. Like, or they've said that to me and my partner. And I'm like, "Mm, this is a safe space. It's not going to happen, but I'm like, we're not that good of friends. (laughs) So I'm like, maybe that'd be okay, but is it going to be weird? And I'm like, I don't know. So then I get in my head and then I'm like, now, now it definitely can't happen because now I'm too fucking in my head. So I want to know, and it's not about me, but I'm just curious, like, should you fuck your friends or should you leave it behind? Does it just depend on the person? What do you think? Yeah, it so depends on the person. There, There's some friends where I just, the wall is up and it's never going to come down. And other ones, I must say, I'm very flirty with my friends. I'm very ni- non-hierarchical. So if I have a partner, I'm still sending, you know, roses and cards and, you know, love and kisses to my friends too. So I don't differentiate. But having sex is crossing a line and... I think like everything, it's like a good conversation with yourself, a good conversation with them. Like, what will this mean? I've had a friend hit on me when she was really drunk and she really wanted to kiss me and I didn't really want to. I mean, this was when I was in my twenties and I just kissed her because I didn't want her to feel rejected, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to do that anymore. I also want us to live in a world where we could just be playful with our friends. Like for me, I must say, if things go below the waist, it has a lot more gravity. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if someone gets near my pussy, it's like this invisible golden cord comes out of my pussy and wraps around them. And there's issues and connection and it's complicated Mm -hmm. for me. If it doesn't go below the belly button and we just make out and touch chests or touch boobs, like that can be really fun. And it doesn't, the stakes aren't as high. And I actually am kind of curious for you both, like if you can relate to that or it's not so much about below the waist for both of you. Yeah. hundred percent below the waist it's more deep for me. Actually, I just, I just had an experience like two days ago with, you know, we went, went on a new date with, with someone and, you know, we spent a lot of time talking and it was awesome and wonderful. And we were both like wanting to hook up with each other, but waiting for the other person to hit on. And this is a, a, a man, a penis owner waiting for the other person to like make a move. And I can see why he didn't make a move because I'm like, fuck the patriarchy. Now. So he's like, like 
wait for you to do is there so and then anyways they we got late you know like 11 p.m and then it was like okay well time to go and so i'm like do you want me to um you know walk you to your car and i'll we can make out your car and he's like okay yeah and then and in i was your like, car on it on his car not by his car because okay. we had an Hi. And, and, but the, and i was like yeah so honestly i've been trying to figure out like are you into me i think you are because we've been talking for like seven hours and yeah and, and i but i can't figure out and he was like Oh no no! I'm into. I'm like oh. He's like I, he's like I just didn't want to be the creepy guy, so that's why I was waiting for you to initiate. And so uh, then I said, to him, I was like oh okay, I totally get it. And it's not, there's nothing creepy about telling me like hey, I'd like to kiss you. Can I kiss you? And he's like oh, okay. So hey, I'd like to kiss you. Can I kiss you? And then we started making out. But then like you know and like it, 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 there was you know hot and heavy making out. But at that point, I had to assess like. If it goes below the belly button, I'm in to me, at least we need to invest some more time in that. Like it's yeah. already 11 p.m. We've been hanging out since three. This opens up all kinds of other portals and doors. So I, that's when I like the way you were talking about. That's when I was like, I think like, let's just keep it above, you know, above the pants um, and then bookmark that here. <laughs> and then in the future, if we hang out again, then maybe the pants come off. And he was like all good. Um, totally. And uh, I totally got it. Like, did I want to fuck him? Yes. But I knew like there was a lot more to it if I did. I have the stakes are higher. Like if we go below the pants, I definitely want a call the next day or I want connection or I want texting. And then our totally socialized brain, female brain says, you should want to marry me. You touch my pussy, which I get that is completely irrational, but I didn't make these rules. They came to me when I was too young. And so I just know that about myself. So it's very rare that I go blow the bell on a first date. That's just a way, you know, because then if they disappear, I'm upset. Like Mm. if, if you're going to ghost, then I just, I don't like it. Yeah. I'm with you. I also, I had a dear lesbian friend that when I was going through my divorce, you know, because I was in the queer scene for a minute in LA and we were like just hanging out like we normally did. We probably drank a little bit too much. And I was like, you know what? I've been with women. They just can't. And I, and I generalized, sorry, everyone, this is way before the podcast and all my education, but I was like, women just can't make me come. And she's like, I bet I could. And I was like, "Mm, I don't think so. And she's like, let me have a chance. I was like, okay, fine. So she, she took a shot at it and, and, and home court advantage. (laughs) <laughs> I, but I was also drink, drinking. I was also in my head because I was like, my friend is fucking me right now. And number three, I was like, yeah, like I think that I was slightly like um, almost about to have my moon cycle happen. And so anyway, what happened was I didn't orgasm and we're still homies now. I love her so much. And we laugh about that shit because there was like no like turn on or making out it was more like her trying. It was like it was almost like a bet. It's like experimental. Or yeah, it was yeah. Like experimental. Yeah. But that didn't change our friendship. And so that went outside of my typical box. So that's why I was wondering about y'all and like um, Sounds like it went into your box. Yeah. It totally Ooh. Did. Yeah. Ooh. And I feel like with Amy, <laughs> Amy, you've been good about hooking up with dude friends because you don't really hook up with female friends that you have, but like dude friends you've like or stayed friends with or had like sexual experiences. And I feel like that's easier for me than than women friends. Yeah. A lot of what we've been talking about the threesome stuff, I'm like a lot of this just applies to like one on one sex, right? Like yeah. what you yeah. were saying earlier, April, about your your tips and advice for threesomes. And it was like that well the same would apply also. I know we're talking about threesomes, but just anyone that you're you're hooking up with, you know, and, and so I think, and maybe you can let me know what you think about this, April. I think threesomes can, and like the knowledge between how to do threesomes can really inform just one-on-one sex in a really powerful way because it's like, you know, things are more complicated, but then with one-on-one, it's like condensing this, a lot of the same conversations that could be useful. Yeah. I learned to exercise at a Tantra event with Steve and Lokita and they sat across from each other and they kind of made these gestures with their hands. Like let's, this is what I want to take out of our sex time together. And it's like judgment, being critical, uh, you know, worrying. And then this is what I want to put into my sex, you know, and my connection with you, which is openness and love. And it was such a simple exercise and experience. And I think that's also good for any number of groups that you're, or, one individual they're going to have sex with is doing something like that to create a little intention around it. Totally. Intentions, everything. Yeah. And it just makes everything safer. Yeah. Yeah. Breakfast. Intention. Pooping. 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> three for a loop with that one. You know what? Perhaps I haven't thought about it that Intentional way. Intentional pooping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Miss April, we have to ask you, there's this this thing that is called the slut pledge mm. that you have talked about. So we have to ask, what is the slut pledge? Yeah, I was hanging out with my sister, Celeste Hirschman, and I was just talking about being a slut. And she's like, just claim that. Raise your hand and say, I am a slut. So I did it. We we're all doing it. I am a slut. That's I'm it. a slut that's, too. I'm a big old slut. Yeah. That's the slut <laughs> pledge. And so instead of worrying if people are going to judge us or call us that, we're just claiming it. Mm. And so that's the slut pledge. So for all sluts, no one needs to be shamed. No one needs to be stuck in the scarlet letter. And I also want us to come up with more words, especially for women on what is a sexually empowered woman. But like, I would love to have one word. I can only think of words too, like sexually adventurous, sexually empowered. So get back to me. Or if you think of any now, like just right. If, if we can't name it, we can't claim it. Yeah. To our listeners, if you have any ideas, shoot us an email. <laughs> what about buttery sluttery? No, it's two words. That's not, <laughs> it's connected, the but, but it's buttery sluttery. <laughs> we still got sluttery in there, which is Slutter, fine. Buttery. But yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think of words that just, so this is another thing that I would love for us to do. So what we've done in our culture in any group is marginalized is we've reclaimed the slur, right? We've reclaimed queer. We've reclaimed slut. We've reclaimed dyke, everything, right? Which is great, but think about it. Then we're never naming ourselves. And we're starting with a word that was fraught from the beginning, mm -hmm. right? We've made it beautiful, you know, that probably the N word is the most complicated one, you know, that anyone could, you know, deal with. But all of it is like, that wasn't what African-American people chose. They weren't like, let's work with this word. No, this is always what the oppressor puts on us. So it's those, I'm a, again, I'm both and. We're not going to get rid of all of these slurs that we've reclaimed. But what if we had words for ourselves? What would we call ourselves? Where is that conference where we're saying, what do we want to call sluts? What do we want to call dykes? What do we want to call queers? In addition to, because some of that is, almost elementary school logic. Oh yeah, you called me a slut. Well, I'm going to claim I'm a slut. Great. We've mm -hmm. benefited from that. But let's mature and have a discussion about self-naming. Any of our friends out there with a PhD in linguistics? <laughs> call me yeah. baby. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that I'm going to I'm going to uh, probably have dreams about this now and then all of a sudden it'll pop in and it'll probably and then I'll it'll be like really and I wake up like that is not relevant. I at have all. two <laughs> friends with PhDs in linguistics. I'm not kidding. Yeah, One lives in LA. Them. I should reach yeah. out to her. She had a baby so I haven't heard from her in a while. Well, she has time to think about the word slut then. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, well, no. <laughs> meaning she probably doesn't. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, so we have to wrap up soon but we would love to learn more about what people can expect from Desire Makes Me Brave. And you also have another book all about breakups. Can you tell us a little bit more about that one as well? Yeah, well, I'll start with my newest baby, Desire Makes Me Brave, because it came out in March. So what I think is unique about it is the way that I break the fourth wall and talk directly to the reader. And that helped me not get overwhelmed by having a arc and a theme. It just made me be like, this is who I am. And so that's something that's fun and unique. The other thing, which I've never seen in a book, and maybe it exists and I don't know about it, is I actually put what my editors have said throughout out the book, like April, you know, what are your truths? You should explore them. And I put that like at the very end of the book, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense, you know? So it's been really fun to mess with the literary canon, the literary traditions, and just like throw my editor's comment in there. And often I'm like arguing with them. Like they told me to do this thing and I couldn't do it, but I published my book anyway. So that's been fun to get feedback about that. But mainly it's really a book about, you know, it's a great beach read because it's a book about travel. So it's really fun to just be reading about my time in Nepal or my time in Spain or my time sledding it up with a jungle beast in, you know, Puerto Vallarta. Hmm. Kind of sounds like you and I are April. Uh, we have the same name. And maybe some of the similar experiences. Because I've sledded it up all over the have world. You up with a Scottish man in Thailand who had a Prince Albert. Oh, let's person. see. Scottish. <laughs> if you God. have, then we are seriously the same person. <laughs> Who did I hook up with in Thailand? God, I don't think they had accents, which is such a bummer. I was cheating on my girlfriend at the time. So my Thai hookups were fraught. Yeah. English guy in Nepal before Thailand. I love anyone who's listening. Come at me. 
I'm pretty much single and I love accents. Ooh. So let that be said. Scottish yeah. English to the front. Mm, yeah. South African. I can throw on an accent for you. April. Oh. <laughs> let me tell you. Oh, out. She's bringing oh. your nipple out. She's oh. got her, oh, wait, everyone watching everyone on YouTube. YouTube. Oh, we've got feathers and nipples. We got and this, the, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, like yellow. Yeah. Oh my God, you guys are both like peacocks attract, yeah. attra- attract each other right now. Yes. This is awesome. Oh my God. <laughs> this, I love this was great. Uh, so, <laughs> wait, we didn't hear about the other book though, that, the breakup book. Thank oh, yeah, you. the breakup book. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Don't, we don't want to forget about my first child here. So, uh, this came out in 2019 and this is a self-help book. So it's not about so much about my breakups, although it comes up a little bit. It's about your breakup and your divorce. Some people have also said that best breakup ever has helped them with like death of someone they love, right? Because mm-hmm. that's an ending too. So I wrote best breakup ever because I was looking for support when I was having a breakup and I went to the library and out of desperation, I got a book called, it's called a breakup because it's broken. And That couple that wrote the book pissed me off, honestly. Like I felt unseen as a bisexual woman. I felt condescending too because it was all about like things are rough now, pretty lady, but chin up and get a man. And I was like, no. And it's very focused on women. What else did they write? He's just not that into you. Mm -hmm. So their book- Which is a movie. Mm -hmm. Right. They're, you know, their movies and books are very condescending. And I don't know if they're ever going to hear this podcast and if they're coming for me, but- yeah. And the their breakup book was a lot about women like screaming outside their ex-boyfriend's window. And, you know, it, hey, that that's part of the human experience, but it's very cultivated. And, you know, they really focus on women that go a bit nuts though and do all these things that are pretty humiliating after breakups. And I just like makes women seem like a one note as many romantic comedies make mm-hmm. women see like seem like a one note. So my book got created so that it'd be a place for poly and queer and people that have different relationship styles to feel heard. And it's really different. It has recipes and it has silly advice and it has a lot of humor because breakup books in themselves can be kind of sad. Like I, I love Pema Children. I'm a big fan. And there was times where her book, When Things Fall Which, Apart. Yeah, yeah. I read that right after my divorce yeah. started. Yeah. yeah. And it worked for me. And then another time I tried to open it up and I'm like, this is so depressing that it's making things worse. You know, mm-hmm. so you have to find the special sauce for you in a breakup and divorce. But I think giving someone this book and I give away a lot of them, you know, when they're going through a breakup or divorce is a really nice thing to do. Mm-hmm. And that's the, so both of your books I believe um, are not, they're not for uh, just vulva owners. They're for anybody that is experiencing either a breakup and or someone that wants to maybe explore their bisexuality uh, and learn more about kind of ways to navigate that. Is, am, I, am I correct in saying this? Yeah, definitely both books are for everyone. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Okay. Or anyone just wants a good beach read. Ooh, desire, yeah. <laughs> desire makes me brave. Yeah. I'm getting yeah. that for my next trip. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Um, okay. So how can people find you? How can they buy your books? I think that they're everywhere, but, um, and, uh, here, cause you also have a podcast, give everyone all, all the, the juicy ways to find April. Yeah. I just, uh, relaunched my memoir, love and tarot podcast called heart centerfold. And I am April Hirschman on all the socials. So TikTok, IG, Facebook, LinkedIn, everything. So I'm pretty easy to find. Yeah. And what about, so can you find your books anywhere books are sold or just go to your website? Or Well, I love people to do bookstore activism. So please ask for my book at your local bookstore. Yeah. And then, then short of that, you can get it at bookshop, which also supports local bookstores. And then there's Amazon or Barnes and Noble. So those are all places. And that's bookshop.org, everyone. And we'll have the links in the show notes, but remind us of your website because that will also have all the information where people can buy your book too. Yeah, it is aprilhirschman.com. Oh, well, that's easy. That is <laughs> easy. And if you don't know how to spell Hirsch, then you can look it up and see. But it's, it's H- in the title of R- <laughs> H C H M A N. Okay. Hirschman. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I really appreciated this episode. I love a fellow April, and you actually you were born in the month, which is even more beautiful. So your Aries fire. I love some fire energy. Thank you for sharing just some space with us and your incredible books that I feel like anyone could benefit from. There's no matter who you are out there, 
you're a human being, you've definitely either been through a breakup or you will probably go through one eventually. And if it's not a breakup, it could be a death. It could be everything in life is a cycle, everyone. So not to uh, tame your little uh, virgin ears, but things do die, but then they, that creates new life. So remember that. And you can swear and do the slut pledge when you buy desire makes me brave. You can, you know, be like, hi, I'm April. I'm April too. I swear that I'm a slut too. I'm taking the slut pledge. Slut for life. Yeah. (laughs) Shameless sluts. I feel like our books are Mm. cousins, shameless sex and desire makes me brave. And we should have a topless book event yep. together. Yes, let's do it. Well, I'm, I'm all about this. And uh, to all of the folks out there, Amy and I are on tour. So come check us out. We'll be in Chicago. We'll be in Portland. We'll be in LA. We'll also be in Seattle. You have to go to shamelesssex.com to find us. You go to connect and you check out where we'll be. We want to see you soon. We're also, at this point, you just missed us in New York. So sorry, sorry. but you will see us again. So stay tuned with us. And- and listen to us every single Tuesday. Also rate us on your preferred iTunes slash Spotify slash whatever the fuck you're listening to us on. You can check us out on YouTube. And if you don't like me saying fuck, then I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, but I'm not. She's fucking sorry. I'm fucking sorry. <laughs> um, I, all right. My voice is back though. I'm really excited Thank about God. that. Yes. Um, all right. We love you all so much. Thank you for being a shameless sex revolutionary. We'll see you next Tuesday. Ciao for now.